very much. I think that uh, we are going to talk about uh, organizational capacity to support uh, quality research stuff. And the three topics that we had picked up to talk about was culture, leadership, and incentives. And I think the discussion is already starting in terms of leadership, as well as uh, incentives that need to go in or the organizations need to provide in order to create an environment for quality research to happen. Uh, usually, I mean, it's, it's a broader discussion when you talk about organizational capacity because we talk about, pro, uh, let's say, people, processes, as well as pro uh, products, as well as the external environment. But in this session, we are continuing with the people, so we kind of keep to the three topics of culture, leadership, and incentives and not go beyond those three aspects. The se session's plan, I think we are a bit over time as, as it is. Uh, but what we are trying to do is that culture, I would do a small presentation. Uh, in terms of leadership, it will be Horazio, and in terms of incentives, Jean would kind of come back again. Uh, what we would like to see is uh, what, you, what has worked in your organizations, uh, what has not worked in your organizations, as well as if there is something that is innovative that had been done in your organizations that can be shared and so that the others also can replicate them. Uh, Okay, my quick introduction to, uh, to organizational culture. Uh, there are very many definitions on organizational culture, but I'm using one of the most simplest one, which is about saying, okay, if there is something that goes wrong or there is something that happens really well, then you always come, uh, you always say, okay, this is how we work around here. I mean, that usually comes out in lots of people's uh, statements, either in a defense where things have gone wrong or when things have worked right in terms of being quite, pride, or quite proud of what they have done. Uh, they all form on the basis of, let's say, there are various beliefs, there are values, lessons that have been learned over the years, as well as assumptions that go into creating this particular culture that the organizations profess. I mean, uh, organizational culture usually is quite unique. And that culture comes out of various aspects, as I said, in terms of beliefs, values, lessons learned, as well as assumptions. But what we are trying to look at is not organizational values that are kind of stated in public statements. Uh, say, for instance, uh, people state excellence, integrity, respect, communication. And those four aspects were the statements, uh, those four aspects were in Enron's mission or uh, statement that they put out saying that this is what they are. But of course, they didn't in any way replicate or bring that statements into their internal culture. So the discussion that we want to lead here is more on the internal culture of the organizations. Just as much as Enron stated that they had excellence, integrity, respect, and communication, they had absolutely no communication with their shares, shareholders, Ni neither did they respect their, their investments, so things didn't work out well. So the discussion that we should have is more of the intrinsic values that we have in our organization. Uh, even if you look at certain organization values, they can be complementary as well as you know, contradictory, or let's say that are in conflict. Uh, if you look at complementary values, it could be independence, and then, of course, uh, a personal achievement. On the other hand, their organizations also could have conflicting values, which are, say, for instance, independence, uh, but, sorry, um, autonomy, and then teamwork. So both of them, of course, are kind of quite diverse, but organizations sometimes do have values of such nature. So we, we could have a quick, quite a good discussion on whether the values that you have in your organization is complementary or, con or in conflict with one another. Uh, there is also a, a norm that strong organizational cultures help Organization, organizational changes to happen. If the organizational culture is weak, then it usual, what usually happens is that changes bring about chaos in the organization. Where there is organizational culture which is strong, and if the change also is in line with the organizational culture, then the changes go through quite well. Um, I can bring in one, one example from our organization just to start off the discussion. Uh, SEPA pride it, prides itself in being a learning organization that provides quite a bit of space, creative space. Uh, it's about mentoring because let's say the work that we do is largely based on primary data. There is collection of primary data, which basically means that there is a number of people who are, at, who are quite senior as well as junior who are involved in that particular research work. So it's all about uh, mentoring, it's about nurturing, it's about trust, it's about openness. 
But what happened, and, and then of course the system that we had in terms of reporting time was a simple, you know, what did you do during these eight hours? But the management then decided, okay, we, wanted to, we want to kind of have a more efficient system. So what they introduced was a system of saying, okay, you have to tell us now every half an hour what did you do? which kind of create, created a, a kind of, let's say, argument within the organization, because the organization prided, prided itself on being on trust, on mutual trust within the organization. And is the management then thinking that we are not actually doing our work? And then we are also talking about people being innovative and, uh, you know, space to create. And suddenly you have this slot of half an hour. I mean, sometimes your thinking process takes you beyond that half an hour. You, you might have thought through the whole day and not made any sense. So, you know, is the organization then trying to say, we are not being productive, we are not being, be, not being useful. So it was an organization, it, it, it basically meant that the culture of the organization didn't fit it with the systems that the organization was trying to implement. I'm just giving that example as a kind of a thought provoking process so that our discussion is also kind of uh, useful. The question then we want, that we want to ask is, um, what kind of aspects in the organizational culture allows for motivating staff to do quality research? So that's the basic question that we, that we would like you to discuss. Uh, we probably have around 10 minutes because I think we're already over time, so we'll try to limit it to about 10 minutes. Thank you, so the floor is open to you now. And I can talk. Uh, I think it's important to have a culture where mistakes are seen quickly, like where you can present your research project rather early to others to comment on and to be welcoming of, 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 of those early errors, and that will fix the long-term results. Two things. Um, the one is a culture of collegiality, which I think has a good... good uh, pedigree in, acad in the fields of academic inquiry and the question for me is how do we nurture cultures of collegiality in contexts where very often even research processes are structured as production or delivery processes because collegiality is of necessity about doubt and inquiry and, and non-linear uh, relating rather than simple kind of output uh, delivery modalities and that for me I think is a key cultural question that faces research organizations in particular. People are motivated, um, we encourage people to make presentations to a whole uh, community and so they can receive feedback and they know that the feedback they will receive, it's really um, trying to improve their work. So they have to like, raise the bar. And this is particularly uh, important for the, for the younger people doing res these uh, research projects com that were competed away. Yeah. And Nick, uh, one of the important attributes also that, you know, how you promote democracy within your organization. And uh, that democracy gives the signals, you know, that, you know, and to create that democracy with transparency. So each and everything, you know, uh, is open to us. I think it's a, it's a great challenge on the management at the same time, but, you know, one has to do that uh, for uh, making it more participatory, more ownership in the organization. I think since uh, think tanks have uh, various projects, it is very important that people who work in the project, they are not into a ghetto, so into a ghetto, you know, enclave, you know. So institutional, uh, you know, development of institutional identity is very important. So how do you do that? Because uh, it often ha happens that they are doing some work in a project, you know, but they don't have interaction with others. So that is that is a major major problem. So how do you tackle that? I think, for example, at our center, we have our lunch together, okay, that is one condition, so people get to, you know, interact with each other. And then every month we have a, we have a meeting where all the, you know, colleagues are there and they say who is doing what, everyone reports. And then the other thing that we do is that we go out 
you know, we, we have um, inter-floor you know, competition or we go out to some place where all the, you know, including the family members. We have also found that that is also very important in order to have collegiality. Yeah. Or in relation to, uh, you know, being a market leader in what you're doing? Uh, or is it on individual initiatives and freedom? I mean, where would you see and where, what do you think a think tank should be aiming at in, in that kind of categorization? Uh, I think uh, I, I see some trade-off between productivity and also having a, sometimes a, a very casual environment and sometimes when you actually, you pay a lot of attention to productivity, you are likely to have also a bit of turnover because there are some people who find they cannot fit in the, in the environment. So it's a, it's a very important balancing act because if it's easy, it's going, you have no system of performance uh, appraisal, uh, you don't see it wrong, you don't, then you know, you'll have a lot of dead weight and productivity will suffer. So you may have a lot of people, but then productivity is, is very low. So it's a, one has to do a, a balancing act, and they also uh, have uh, as much as uh, here like it's not too much. People also get a sense of uh, uh, of um, uh, what can I say? They they also don't like when it is completely uh, there is a lack of structure. So it's a, you, you need to have a bit of uh, uh, how things flow without necessarily it being. Uh, too much uh, to choke uh, to choke people, so uh, I think it's really a balancing act, and I think one has to at the end of the day, depending on again context, if you are judged by the productivity, then you know uh, what you are, the kind of uh, environment you have to to create. Uh, it has also actually been uh, in in an environment if you don't have, for instance, a good uh, performance measurement uh, system. Everybody's role, uh, you get a convergence into a lower productivity because somebody says, why should I produce uh, four, three papers in a year when somebody is producing only one or less and we all get the same salary? So, so you end up with a, with a, with a lot of uh, a problem. One way of motivating staff to, is to make them feel important. And participation is one, uh, you know, basically one way of doing that. But, you know, I mean, it's a balancing act between, you know, participation and also outputs. It's, it's always difficult. But uh, to f the young, especially for young researchers, to feel a part of the process, to be able to contribute in the inputs and also the outputs of identifying research areas also you know, how to go about it is quite important of also nurturing them. Uh, so it's difficult at times, I did, I, but it pays off because they have an allegiance to the organization and, and also they feel part of the whole system. And, you know, what uh, Professor Mustafi has said, if they work in silos, it's very difficult to get them out of silos. So I think cutting across silos is quite important to f make them feel a part of the organization. Uh, <clears throat> for quality research, I think uh, besides the uh, uh, research environment, the administrative and logistics management environment is also very important for the uh, easiness uh, or uh, um, uh, fast finishing of their jobs. Young researchers are not of tolerable of uh, bureaucracy. So we have to be able uh, smoothing and creating conducive environment where they can work and stay long at the office. What you're saying is that you need a you need to have more participatory. Participatory and as well as uh, uh, making a conducive environment where they can communicate with finance and other logistics departments.
So what, what I hear, I mean, the sense, as I said, there are four different types of organizational culture that people come out with. Uh, one is more about participatory. The other one is very hierarchical. The other one is more about, you know, results orientation. We do this in some way. Uh, the other one, uh, more individual initiative and freedom. And I see that it's the, one of the four that seem to be coming out much more than having a more hierarchical organization, neither having a results, very you know, strict results orientation, but more about consensus, being participatory uh, communication, which is probably the more line that uh, most of the think tanks seems to be following then.